All right, well, we're continuing our series in Twisted Scripture, and today we're going to look at two more lies, and they are very interrelated. We're going to be looking at the classic struggle in Romans chapter 7. I'm doing the very thing that I don't want to do, and is that the normal Christian life? You know, growing up, I heard it was. I heard it was the normal Christian life, and hey, if Paul struggled to that degree with sinning of every kind, sold in bondage to sin, then guess what? There's not any real hope for you this side of heaven. It'll get better when Jesus comes back, but right now, man, you're just going to have to be a slave to sin and deal with it. So we're going to be looking at that lie, and then the question is, well, if we're not under law and we're under grace... Is it possible that too much grace leads to even more sinning? Are we going to end up setting world records for sin if we invite too much grace into our lives? Is grace dangerous? These are questions we'll be asking. And so we start today with lie number 18, and that is Paul's Romans 7 struggle is the normal Christian life. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, Romans chapter 7, Paul is detailing a fight that he is having. You might title this section, I fought the law and the law won, right? You remember the classic song? Well, that would be a perfect title for this passage of Scripture because that is exactly what this Jewish man was going through. And I want you to think about his goal in Romans chapter 7. His goal is keeping the law. Now, is that the Christian's goal? Of course not. We know we're dead to the law, not under the law. Christ is the end of the law. But in Romans 7, this gentleman's goal is to keep the law. And in particular, he is very worried about his coveting problem. So he's under a law, thou shalt not covet. He's trying his best not to covet, not to want other people's stuff. And what he finds in his life is coveting of every kind. And this is Romans 7 in our face in brilliant technicolor of Jewish man with all his effort, more effort probably than you and me have ever exerted in our lives. And yet he came up short living in failure. And so then the question is, was this the Apostle Paul as a Christian struggling under the law, trying to keep the law, and yet failing day in and day out? Or was this the Apostle Paul before salvation as a devout Jew, as a Pharisee, trying to please God before salvation, before his conversion? And so this morning, I'm going to present some possible reasons that Paul was talking about before salvation, before he came to know Jesus. So what we see in Romans 7 is not the normal Christian life. There is something better and greater for us today. So here's the first argument, the first idea. In Romans chapter 7... Paul opens this way. He says, Don't you know that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? So think about what Paul is saying here. He's talking about when the law has jurisdiction over your life. Now, does that seem true today as a Christian? Does the law have jurisdiction over your life? No, it does not. You live under grace. And so we have died with Christ, but Paul struggled while the law had jurisdiction over him. Law keeping seemed to be his goal, whereas law keeping is not the goal of the Christian life. So this is our first reason in the very first verse in Romans chapter 7, the first reason that we can come to conclude that Paul is talking about his former life In Judaism, as a devout law keeper, he was trying his best. His friends found him blameless, but he had a severe addiction to coveting that was hidden. It was covert, covert coveting, hidden underneath. 
and he wasn't playing all his cards, and everybody thought he was righteous, but he was a whitewashed tomb. So reason number one then, Paul is talking about when the law had jurisdiction over him. But as Christians, the law doesn't have jurisdiction over us. Secondly, another reason that Paul is talking about before salvation is this. Paul says that he is unspiritual and sold in bondage to sin. Now, I would ask you this this morning. Is that true of you? Are you unspiritual? Are you sold in bondage to sin today? Not if you have been bought with a price. You are not sold in bondage to sin if you were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You do not belong to sin if you are a person of God's own possession. And so we see in Romans 6, one chapter prior in Romans 6, Paul says, whoever has died is freed from sin. And guess what? We've died. We died with Christ. Our old self died, crucified, buried, raised. That's the born again experience. You can't be born again unless you die first. Believers have died and we are freed from sin. So therefore, it makes no sense for us to wake up Monday morning and say, I am sold in bondage to sin. This description in Romans chapter 7 must be true only of an unbeliever. Sure, I could say lots of things Monday morning. I could say I'm being overwhelmed by temptation. It's hitting me big time. I could say I've messed up 400 times in this area. I could say I struggle. I could say with James, I stumble in many ways. I could say all those things. But if you hear me say I am sold in bondage to sin and unspiritual, then I'm talking about my former life as an unbeliever or I don't know what I'm saying. And so, another reason. Now, here's another argument for why Paul is talking about his struggle before salvation. Paul speaks of the struggle when the commandment came into his life. Now, I would ask you, when did the commandment come into Paul's life? Think about the history of Saul of Tarsus. He starts out as a little kiddo. He's born in the right tribe. He's born on the right day. He's circumcised according to the law. He's given tutors. He's told that he will be an expert in the law and he should train, train, train. So when did the commandment come into his life? Was it Paul at age 35? No, it was Paul at age 3.5. I mean, from very young within Judaism, he was introduced to the Jewish law. When did the commandment come into Paul's life? As a young Pharisee, a scholar of the law, Paul was introduced to the law at a very young age before his conversion to Christianity. So, I don't know if you've ever heard jokes like this, but many of them start with lines like, So a guy walks into a bar. Or maybe you're telling a story. So I'm on my way to school. So I'm driving to work. Now, are you talking about a present event or a past event? You're talking about a past event, aren't you? So let me tell you a story. I am on my way to school and I get hit. I get blindsided. But has that already happened? Yes, that's already happened. Why am I talking about it in present tense? Because I want you in it. I want you in the story. I want you in the experience. I want you to enjoy the, the recounting of what already happened, but I'm going to tell it in present. So a guy walks into a bar. So I'm on my way to school, and Paul is doing the very same thing. The commandment comes into his life, and it kills him. I'm sold in bondage to sin. Let me tell you all about it, guys. It's the story of when he was sold in bondage to sin, but he's talking about it in present tense so that they will be invited in to the experience. Paul speaks of the struggle when the commandment came, and the commandment came long ago for him at age three or four as he began looking into the law and was taught as a baby practically. 
Paul says also, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. Now, this is a curious phrase because he's saying that the struggle was while we were in the flesh. Now, I ask you this morning, are you in the flesh or are you in Jesus Christ? And this is a very important decision for you to make because Romans chapter 8 says, every believer is no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, let's make sure everything's real clear this morning. I mean, obviously, guys, can we wake up tomorrow and set our minds on the flesh? Yes. Can we wake up tomorrow and walk according to the flesh? Yes. But are we always in the Spirit? Yes. Our geography doesn't change. Our location doesn't change. Our closeness to God doesn't change. And so we are in the Spirit with two ways to walk. We are in the Spirit with two ways to set the mind. So it is clear as day that we can set our minds according to the flesh and engage in stinking thinking sometimes. And have you noticed five seconds or five minutes later, you've already done a turn. You pulled a 180 and you're thinking and now you're fixing your eyes on Jesus and everything feels... But, but what, wait a minute, you were interrupted by an alternate message. And so you flipped from Father's mentoring channel, the FM dial, over to that alternate message, the AM dial, and you entertained a temptation, a thought, an accusation, some condemnation, but you caught yourself, and now you're back over to Father's mentoring channel again. Father, I don't want to think that anymore. I reject that. I, I renounce that. I want nothing to do with that. I'm dead to that. I'm alive to you. Does this sound like your normal, everyday human experience bouncing back and forth from one thought to another thought? But at no time during that adventure, at no time are you taken out of the Spirit. You are always in the Spirit. And so we see that there are two ways to walk, two ways to set your mind, but there is one location for the Christian you are permanently in the Spirit. I and you, and you and me. That's what Jesus prayed for. That prayer came true, and it is permanent. He will never leave you. And so when Paul says, while we were, past tense, while we were in the flesh, sinful passions were aroused by what? What were the sinful passions aroused by? The law. Are we under the law? No, when were they aroused? When we were in the flesh. Are we in the flesh? No, we're in the Spirit. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about how he fought the law and the law won. And he said at the end of this passage, Who will rescue me from this death? And who rescues him from death? Jesus Christ. How? On that Damascus road, he comes to Jesus. He exchanges death for life. He exchanges bondage for freedom. He exchanges in the flesh for in the spirit. And he becomes alive for the very first time. So what we see then is Paul's talking about his life before salvation. Paul says also, and this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. Now, I would ask you, what Christian in their right mind would think that the commandments of the Old Testament, the law, are going to bring them life? I mean, hello, isn't step one to becoming a Christian saying that I need Jesus to save me, not Moses, that I'm dead in my sins and I need life in Christ? And so I turn away from self-effort and I turn toward the grace of God. And that's the revelation that we have when we get saved. And so what he's saying here is there was a time in my life when I thought the commandment was going to give me something, make me right, and it didn't. So when would Paul have imagined that the law would bring him life? These are the thoughts of a devout Jewish man who was under the law trying to get life from the law. 
All right, well, next we see Paul says, When the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. So are you saying that sin was never alive for Paul? Sin was never alive for Paul until age 35 when he was a legalistic Christian? Do you see what we're doing? We're reading Romans 7 through legalistic Christian glasses. That's what we're doing. Well, I really struggled under legalism, so that must be Romans 7. Well, it's true that legalism will cause us to struggle, but Paul had a deeper issue since he was age three. Sin became alive the moment that he met the law. Sin was alive before that, but he didn't even know about it. The commandment made him aware. When did sin first become alive in Paul's life? When was Paul killed by the commandment? When Saul, Saul of Tarsus, met the law, it killed him. That would have been true as a devout Pharisee. So, do you see why we're going through this exercise of looking at a number of passages in Romans 7 and highlighting some verbiage? The reason is this. We don't want to give up and live in misery buying into the idea that my current sin struggle is all there is. Even the author of a lot of the New Testament, he was sold in bondage. He was a slave, miserable man that he was. So for me, well, I guess I can just expect the same. No, no. Yes, we have struggles, but no, we're not doomed to that experience. We're going to talk in just a minute about the path forward and the real hope that we have right now. So what's the takeaway here? Well, the takeaway is this. Anybody who's ever thought that Paul was talking about before salvation or after salvation, guess what? There's a takeaway for everybody. Here it is. Anyone today, a human, whether lost or saved, any human choosing to live under the law will experience sinning of every kind. And apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, I have a friend, Pete Briscoe, and he's been doing some jeeping lately. He's been jeeping in the mountains of Colorado. And I saw this on his Twitter feed, but he took a picture of a road sign on the side of the road. It looked like a mining road, thousands of feet up in the air in Colorado. There he is with his Jeep Wrangler and Libby Briscoe at his side. And they're trekking up this mining road in Colorado. And then they see a roadside sign. And it says, no shooting. Now, there were 40 bullet holes in that sign. Now, isn't that a classic example of what we're talking about? Anybody who chooses to live under the law, they are going to experience sinning of every kind. You are going to end up doing things you never even dreamed of doing. I remember when I was a teenager, I saw this cartoon, and it was a hotel. It was like an eight-story hotel, and then right next to it was a little pond, and there was a little sign there that said, no fishing. And all of the windows in that hotel had been busted out and fishing poles were sticking out. People were fishing into the pond from their hotel room. I mean, again and again and again, we see that we are drawn to the forbidden. We are drawn to what we're not allowed to do. Someone tells us, thou shalt not, and we give it five minutes and we're doing it when we never would have dreamt of doing it in the first place. That is life under the law. And so we think that God gave the law to sort of curb sin and stop sin and prevent sin. Romans 5 tells us the opposite. It says the law came in so that sin would increase. Increase. Think about that. God wanted to expose all the slavery we already had by putting in place something rock solid, cemented as morality and ethics that we could never get to, to show us, I've got an addiction to sin, and I need a major miracle, and it's not Moses. So what's the takeaway here for Romans 7? A believer is not supposed to live under the law. Paul's Romans 7 struggle is not the normal Christian life. Yes, it's the normal law-based life, 
but not the normal faith-based life. Does that make sense? It is the normal law-based life. You put me under law, and that is normal. You put me under grace, and sin won't master me. Do you believe that? That's real. Have you experienced the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the grace of God as your tutor? That's real. I wonder if you're willing this morning to agree to do that free fall into the grace of God and say, you know what, Father, I have been sinning just fine. Under law and legalism and rules and self-effort, I have been sinning just fine. And I've been keeping my rules and asking for your help and keeping my rules and then asking for your help. You know what? I'm ditching the rules. I'm going to live from here. I'm going to trust that something radical has happened. I'm going to trust a relationship, a connection with you that I can't fully explain. But you say, when I let go of the rules, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. When I let go of those, that there's something that catches me and it's your life in me. And then I discover, I don't even want to do those things in the first place. I don't need rules. I don't need thou shouts. I don't need chains. I'm free. And my heart is good. The takeaway, we believers, yeah, we stumble in many ways. Do not hear me this morning saying that Christians never mess up. We mess up every day. We stumble in many ways. James 3 says that. But being sold in bondage to sin and experiencing sinning of every kind is not the normal Christian life. We don't have to put ourselves under the law and watch sin thrive. Amen? Amen. We died to sin. We can count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God every day. Get this. When the lustful thought, when the pornography thought, when the critical thought, when the hateful thought, when the bitter thought comes down your mind, the hallway of your brain, when temptation hits, we don't have to wonder if we are dead enough to a particular sin. Freedom is now. My son Gavin and I, we were watching... Um, Monty Python and the search for the Holy Grail. You know, the Holy Grail movie, Monty Python. We were watching it yesterday. And one of the opening scenes is they're trying to put a body onto a wheelbarrow. You know, like from war or plague or something. They're all dead, almost. They're putting this body on the wheelbarrow. And the gentleman who is the body is saying, I'm not quite dead yet. I've got a lot of life in me, really. And uh, he says, uh, I think I'll go for a walk. And, he, and he's trying to convince the guy to maybe put him down, give him a few more hours until finally the guy just bonks him on the head and says, well, you're dead now. <laughs> when temptation hits, we don't have to wonder if we're fully dead, if we're mostly dead, if we're almost dead Yes, we got stuff, interference up here, you know, in our, in our brain, in our mind. We got interference in our thoughts. But we're talking about your heart. We're talking about your spirit. We're talking about your core. You're not going to get any more debtor to sin than you are right now. And so I was talking with a, a theologian, a gentleman who's known all over the world. He was the chairman of the NIV Bible Committee He's done a lot of great things, published a lot of scholarly articles, and we were talking about being in the flesh versus in the spirit. And he said, Andrew, I like to describe it this way. He says, we're in the spirit now. We're no longer in Adam. We're in Christ. We're no longer in the flesh. We're in the spirit. We've crossed over, but we can still hear the noise from that other realm. And I kind of liked that. Have you noticed you can still hear the noise? You're not in it. You're in Christ. But you can still hear the noise. Even in the midst of that awful, persistent, annoying noise, you can say, I'm 100% dead to that. No thank you. And that is true in every moment with every temptation. We don't have to wait. We're not just mostly dead. All right, uh, the last lie we'll look at today just briefly, and it's completely related and connected. It says this, too much grace will cause you to sin even more. Have you heard this? Hyper grace, cheap grace, greasy grace, 
Okay, greasy grace, now that's just gross. I mean, <laughs> greasy grace, are you climbing a fire pole to God? Greasy grace, cheap grace, it cost Jesus his life and it's free to us. So I don't see the rationale for cheap. It's either very expensive, costing Jesus his life, or it's totally free to us as a gift, but there is no such thing as cheap grace. Hyper grace, as I've often said, yeah, I'm pretty hyper about it. I'm in love with God and his grace. So what did we see already? Well, here's just a quick review of some connected ideas. Is too much grace going to lead to too much sin? Well, actually, too much law will. The sinful passions aroused by the law, so what is it that arouses sinful passions? Is too much grace going to be dangerous? No, too much law is dangerous. That's what he's saying. In the same chapter, look at what it says. Sin takes opportunity through grace. Is that what it says? Sin takes opportunity through grace. Watch out for all that grace. Sin's going to get you. No, he's saying watch out for all that law. Sin's going to get you. Do you see what we're invited to? It is incredible. We're invited to something that is counterintuitive to the human brain. It doesn't make any sense. We do a free fall into Jesus and we're caught by His grace and carried by His grace. That's a miracle. God created the world. That's a miracle. Jesus rose from the dead. That's a miracle. I can live under grace and I won't sin as much. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. It makes no sense. Take all the rules and restrictions, all the morality and ethics, all the principles of the world. Take them all and throw them in the garbage and I will live uprightly. That is a miracle. How did that happen? The resurrection of Jesus living in me. Do you see? That's the trust game. That's where he wants us. Let go of the crutches and walk by grace. The law came in so that the transgression would do what? Decrease? No, increase. I brought the law in so that people would sin even more under the law so they would see their death and see their need for life. Sin shall not be master over you if you're really careful with the rules. Sin will not be master over you if you try your hardest to keep Christian principles. Is that what it says? Sin will not be master over you if you're under grace. And you say, God, how does that even work? It makes no sense. And he says, Jesus in and Jesus through. And that's it. Jesus plus nothing is what we call it around here. Are you willing to go that far? Are you sick and tired of being addicted and acting like you're someone else and being miserable? Are you sick and tired yet of your best effort? 1 Corinthians 15. This is one that's pretty far out there. We don't read it very often. But wow, is it clear. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. <laughs> How much clearer could that get? You want to give sin power? Put yourself under the law and sin will have a heyday. Put yourself under grace and sin falls limp. 2 Peter 1, there's all these qualities. We're so afraid of grace. If you have too much grace, you'll have too much sin. That's what we think. And Peter says the opposite. He says, hey, you want godliness? You want kindness? You want love? If these qualities are yours then you'll never be useless. You'll never be unfruitful. You're always going to have a fulfilling life with kindness and love being exuded through you. How do you do it? Well, he says, here's how you don't do it. If you're lacking these qualities, you have forgotten your purification from your former sins. You have forgotten what God did to you. You have forgotten God's grace. So what's the answer? Remember God's grace. Do you need more grace or less grace? 
Uh, You need to remember more and more the grace that you've been given. Don't go with less grace. Less grace brings less victory. Less grace brings less qualities. God wants you soft. He wants you soft in your attitudes and actions. That's what grace does. It softens us. Legalism hardens us. Grace softens us. You look at these qualities. Kindness, that's soft. Goodness and kindness and love, godliness, gentleness. You look at the fruit of the Spirit, joy and peace and patience. That's soft. That's softened by the grace of God. Our attitudes being mentored by His grace, being instructed and guided and lifted up by His grace and supported by His grace. You can't have too much grace because you can't have too much godliness. They're the same. They're not in competition. They're the same. Titus 2, we'll end just a few moments here. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. But what else does the grace of God do? Look at this. The grace of God instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The only thing that helps us say no to sin is the grace of God. That is the driving force. So just when you think you need to beat yourself up, just when you think you need to pull a Martin Luther and lay out all night in the snow, beating yourself with leather straps, saying, Woe is me, God, I'm a pitiful, poor excuse for a human being. I'm going to humble myself before you and take my licks, take my punishment. Just when you think you need to go Martin Luther, beating yourself up over something you've done, the Spirit of God says, You think that's going to work? You're going to feel sorry for yourself, You're going to talk down to yourself. You're going to look at yourself as dirty and distant, and then you're going to act even more like it. What's the answer? You're clean. You're close. I don't count that against you. I've removed that. I've taken that away as far as the east is from the... I'm not dealing with you on the basis of that. You're my righteousness. I look at you as if you've never sinned a day in your life. You are perfect to me. That's the answer. Mom didn't do it. Dad didn't do it. Church didn't do it. Only God does this perfectly. And He does it every time, affirming you and establishing you and building you up and showing you who you really are. That's the only thing that works. And He's got the market cornered on it. He's the only one doing it right. So are you going to listen to men Or are you going to listen to your God and your Father who is bringing you up in grace? There is no other method. You want to be godly, young men, 18 years old, 25 years old, looking at older men in the faith saying, I want to be like them someday. The answer to that is to know that you are one with Jesus Christ right now. There is no secret outside of the grace of God. You will never graduate from the grace of God. There is no greater message, no deeper message. Paul calls it the gospel of grace. It is the gospel. So what did we see today? The truth, Romans 7, yeah, it's the normal law-based life, but not the faith-based life. It is not normal Jesus. It is normal Moses. And you don't have to be under Moses. You were never invited to the law as a Gentile. Today, you're invited to His grace and nothing else. Likewise, here's the truth for you. Too much grace will lead to even more victory over sin. That's the truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for today. We thank You for Tyler and Whitney and their ministry. We thank You for the opportunity to share in that today with them. We thank you most of all, Father, for Jesus Christ and for this grace you've given us. We're not afraid of you, Father. We're not afraid of your gospel. We're not afraid of your son's life in us. We're not afraid of the freedom you've given us. We're not afraid of the total forgiveness. We're not afraid of the life. 
We believe you. We trust you. You have known us since we were first born. You know what we need. You are our designer, and we are designed to live under your grace. You know us perfectly. We've seen your word today. We're putting our confidence in it. We're believing you at face value. We're not scared. We're not going to believe those accusations. We believe that your grace teaches us to say no to sin. We're not going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, try harder tomorrow, tell ourselves we can really do it this time. We're not going to adopt three more rules and five more steps. We're going with Jesus. Jesus plus nothing, Father. We thank you for the gospel of grace. In your name we pray. Amen.